Well, it's wonderful to be back at Gant Street Baptist Church. We thank the Lord for the church hosting and inviting us to come back for our 45th National Conference. Our theme this week is to God be the glory, and certainly if there's anyone that has ample cause to give glory to God, it's the Rock of Ages ministry. God has been very grateful to us, are very gracious to us over the last several years. We ought to be grateful to Him. With that being said this morning, if you'll take your Bible, we'll go to the book of Psalm, chapter number 29, and we'll look at our theme verse that we have chosen for this week, and I hope that the Sunday School Hour will be of help in setting the uh, tone for the week as far as what the Lord has in store for us. I'm very grateful for Pastor Rowell and for all that God has allowed him to accomplish here in this great work and this great ministry. Uh, this morning, we would ask you to uh, pray. We have several families that are still making their way in, and uh, some that have made it in and not able to be here this morning, and uh, so let's continue to lift them before the Lord. This morning in uh, Psalm chapter number 29, verse number 2, and notice what the Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory, do His name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And our theme is to God be the glory, and I believe that uh, the glory of God that we uh, owe Him is past due in the generation in which you and I live. As we consider some things in our life that happen to long life's journey, uh, there are some things that happen that leave us a dumbfounded that leave us in a state of awe as to the good blessings and the presence of God upon our lives and upon our family. When I think about someone being impacted and left in a state of awe, I'm always reminded of the uh, farmer that lived in a rural area and they went into town for the first time and as they entered into the hotel that they were going to be staying, just as you walked in with the sun, the elevator doors began to open and a lady walked in that was on a cane, a walker, and as she walked in, the doors closed upon her, and just a few moments later, uh, the doors opened, and out walked a young, beautiful young lady walking erect without a cane and without a walker. And he looked at his boy and said, Son, hurry, quick, go get your mom. And <clears throat> left him dumbfounded and in awe. As we consider the things that God has done for us, I believe that there are things that we need to praise God, to give Him the glory, and I believe one of the struggles in our generation that we live in is that people are not giving God the glory that is due His name. There is a song that was written in 1872 by Fanny Crosby. It's entitled, To God Be the Glory. It was used in the Moody campaigns and already sank in England. And it caught hold in England rather speedily, but in the United States it was slow to take hold in the churches. However, the Billy Graham crusade began to use it in some of his crusades and began to include it in some of the hymn books and it took root and now it's one of the standards of the hymns that is sung here in the United States and around the world and is in many of our hymnals to this day. It's one of the few songs that have ever been written that challenges God's people to give God the glory that is due his name. What does the Bible say about giving God the glory? Let me give you a few uh, verses this morning and then we will examine three or four things as time allows as to areas that we need to give God the glory for in our lives. In Psalm 145 and verse number 4, the Bible said, One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. The Bible tells us in Psalm 149, verse number 6, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand. Notice every passage of Scripture deals with the praise of God, the glory of God, that again, that is due His name. I believe if there's one thing that is lacking, it is the passing down from one generation to another, the praise and the glory of Almighty God. I remember when we were in one of our conferences here on our 40th uh, anniversary of the Rock of Ages ministry, we were in our prayer meetings from the 10 o'clock hour to the 12 o'clock hour that's led by Brother Kurt and Ms. Delabo. And I remember as we made our way in, someone in the back of the auditorium had stated, God's still there. And I knew exactly what they meant, and as we gathered around and began to pray, and one of our granddaughters was with us, there was a divine presence of God that was in the midst of the meeting. And you could sense the presence of God. And I remember weeping and thanking God for His divine presence and allowing our granddaughter to feel the divine presence of the Lord in our midst. And I believe we need to pass from one generation to the next generation what God has done for us and the praise and the old-fashioned worship of the Lord. In 
In Psalm 145, 5 and 6, he said, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of, thy, of, the, mighty of, thy terrible, of the might of thy terrible act, and I will declare thy greatness. In Psalm 150 and verse 2, the Bible says, Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the, his excellent greatness. In verse number 6, Let everything that hath breath praise you the Lord. And then he closes with, Praise you the Lord. God commands that we, as his people, give him praise and glory. We live in a day and age where men's philosophy are the me mentality. We live in a me culture. Everything revolves around the individual. We live in a self-centered culture. Everything resolves around a me mentality, a me happiness, a my wants, my pleasure, my desire. And it seems like for the most part in secular culture, everything is about me. But we need to get back to the old-fashioned truth of the Bible that the world does not revolve around you and I, but it revolves around God and His divine word. God's Priority is not our comfort, it is not our happiness, it is not our pleasure, but it is about His glory. Glory is found 371 times in the divine book, and the first mention of the word glory is found in the book of Genesis in chapter number 31 and verse number 1, where we find that in the scripture, Laban's sons have accused Jacob of stealing or robbing their father Laban's glory. And that is the first use of the scripture of the word glory. And today we live in a day and age where that theme is continued throughout society from the beginning of humanity even until today. Where men are robbing God of his glory, that which is due his holy name. When we turn our attention upon ourselves, we rob God of the glory that is due his name. Why did God create the universe? In Psalm 19 and verse number 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And so God created the universe and all that is, that he might show forth his glory to humanity. Why did he choose the Jews? In Isaiah 43 and verse number 7, Every one that is called by my name, for I have created him, he says, for my glory I have formed him, Yea, I have made him. And God chose him for his own personal glory. Why does God allow troubles to enter into our life? Well, according to Psalm 50 and verse number 15, we can find the answer to that question. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And so we find that God allows trouble to come into our lives that when it's all said and done and God has delivered us from our trials, our troubles, and our tribulation, and our sorrows, that we might glorify him for his divine deliverance. Why did God send Jesus to the earth? The Bible tells us in John 17 and verse number 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. And then he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And so we find that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross of Calvary, and paid the sin for our redemption to set us free and break the bondage of sin and shackles of sin that chain you and I and bind us. We find that Jesus Christ fulfilled his will, his purpose on earth. He died, he buried, was resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father, and will save whosoever will, that he might get the glory. We should esteem Christ over everything in our life. We should esteem him over all human beings. We should esteem him over all material things. We should esteem him over anything of, worthly, of earthly value. You know why? Because he is worthy of our praise. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done, Fanny Crosby wrote. To God be the glory. God is the one who should receive honor. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He bought us. He purchased us. He owns us. He is the giver of life. He delivers us in all praise, all honor, and all glory is due His name. Now let me share with you, if I may, for just a few moments this morning, some areas that I believe we ought to consider and give God the glory in. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 40 and verse number 8, the Bible said, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
You say, preacher, what are you saying in that passage of Scripture? What is God trying to get across to you and I from the truth, from God's divine book? He's trying to get across that God's Word shall stand forever, that it shall not change. It is the same in the beginning as it is today, as it is in the end of time. May I just say this morning in brief passing, to God be the glory for the Bible that you and I hold in our hand and have in our lap. Thank God the Bible is the divine book, the Word of God. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 24 and 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Thank God we hold in our hand this morning a Bible that will stand through the ages of time. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse number 85, Forever, O Lord, thy word, thy word, his word, his book, the Bible, God's divine book, is the word of God, and it is settled in heaven. It may be a controversy among men, but thank God it's not a controversy in heaven this morning. I thank God for my Bible. And to God be the glory for the divine, inspired, inerrant scriptures, the Bible, the word of God. Well, I know it's Sunday school, and I suppose it's supposed to be a teaching time, but I can't help it. I've got liberty and I feel like I want to preach just a little bit if you don't mind. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. May I say to you this morning, this Bible, this divine book, it is alive. You say, preacher, why? Some time ago I preached a message entitled, The Breath of God. And what I found is everywhere the breath of God is, there's life. The Bible said that God formed man from the dust of the ground. God reached down and scooped the uh, earth uh, up in his hand, and that clay and he began to form it. He gave it eyes and ears and nose and mouth and feet and hands and arms and ears. And God uh, had that clump of clay. But it was nothing more than mortal clay. But the Bible tells us that God did something unique. He took that clump of clay and... <clears throat> He breathed into man's nostril and man became a living soul. And everywhere you have the breath of God, you have life. Then the Bible tells us that there in the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, the wind blew the breath of God, a blew through the valley. And the Bible said that God raised up servants unto himself. Why? Because God blew through the valley the breath of God. And where there's the breath of God, there's life. And then in the book of Acts, there in the upper chamber, in the upper room, where the Bible said they were gathered in His name, waiting for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God, according to the command given in Acts. And the Bible said, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And in that passage of Scripture, the wind speaks of a hard breath. And I'll tell you what happened on that day. God... <clears throat> He breathed life into His church, empowered them for the ministry that God had given to them. But I wanted to say all of that very briefly to get here. And that is that why this Bible is a living book is because God said, God spoke every word, every verse, every passage, every book, every title, every chapter came from the very breath of God. As He breathed the Bible, the words and the hearts and the ears of the writers and the penmen of the scripture and that's why the Bible is alive. It came, every verse, every jot, every tittle came from the very breath of Almighty God. And so it has life. The Bible is alive. It's quick and sharp and powerful than any two-edged sword. Thank God for the Bible. It's a living book. It's a living book. The Bible is alive this morning. Thank God for our Bible. And then secondly this morning, I want to thank God for our salvation. The Bible says in Psalm 21, in verse number 5, His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. Thank God for the Bible, and he deserves all the glory for the book that we have in our hand this morning, the Bible. But thank God for salvation. The Bible says His glory is great in thy salvation. And you know, may we never get tired or old, uh, of hearing about salvation and how God saved a poor wretched sinner and how that God saved you and I by His marvelous grace. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. 
Aren't you grateful for the salvation that changed your life? Uh, whosoever wills salvation, a salvation that I uh, come to conviction and I turn from my sin to the Savior. I was sick and tired of Terry Ellis and my uh, conscience was pricked and it led me to repentance, to turn from my sin, to turn to Christ. And through that, and when that moment happened, I was converted as a sinner to a child of Almighty God. Thank God for salvation. I don't know if you raise hands or what you do here at Gant Street Baptist Church, but I just want to say this morning, I'm going to raise my hand and say thank God for the Bible, and I'm going to raise my hand and say thank God for salvation, for saving me in my poor, wretched state, and delivering me from the chains of hell and the bondage of sin. Thank God for our salvation. We should thank Him for our Bible. We should thank Him for our salvation. And then thirdly this morning, briefly, I believe we ought to thank Him for our mission, our purpose. In First Chronicles 16, verse number 24, the Bible says, declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations. And that's what we're trying to do at Rock of Ages Ministry, declare the glory of God, the greatness of His salvation, the greatness of His divine, preserved, inspired book, to declare His glory among the heathen. And this morning, if we were to have missionaries to stand and give testimony, we were to have some of the church members to stand and guests to hear this morning, we could all stand and tell of the greatness and the blessings of God and the conversion of sinners who come to know Christ as their Savior. Sometimes it's simple statements we make in our testimonies, our messages, and our witness that God uses to convert the sinner. Here a while back, we are at the Civil Correctional Institution in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we preached on the women's side at the co-ed prison. And in the middle of the message, I just made a general passing statement. I said, you may get what you, you may have gotten what you wanted and found out it's not what you wanted. And in the invitation, five ladies came forward, trusted Christ as their Savior. Each one was broken. They seemed to be contrite in spirit and heart. And the Bible said that God will not reject someone in that status. And uh, they all left. And the, one of the ladies that got saved was, was leading or uh, leading the pack in the back that was getting ready to go out. And uh, she got to the door, she stopped, and she turned around and almost ran back to me, grabbed my hand and said, Mr. Ellis, i got to thank you. Said the, there was one statement out of the whole sermon that stuck to my heart. Said it, it struck me in the heart. It got my attention. You said that you may have gotten what you wanted and found out it's not what you want. She said, that stuck to my heart, and that's what broke me and caused me to come to Jesus Christ. Thank God for our mission. The Bible says in Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. You know what that means? That if we don't give God the glory, and we rob Him of His glory, God will stop giving you and I, and showing His glory in our midst. The book of Isaiah said, uh, there in that passage of Scripture read, My glory will I not give to another. And then First Chronicles in chapter number 6 and verse number 19, he said what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye have not your, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God. Man is made up of a trichotomy. We are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And each one of them is made up of a trinity or uh, three parts as well. And God said concerning our bodies that we are to glorify Him with our bodies of flesh, bone, and blood. And I'm grateful this morning that we have that command and that we can glorify God in our body with our testimony and with our uh, testimony with the church and with sinners without the gospel. But I'm glad this morning that we can testify of the good grace of God and with our body and with our flesh, and with our uh, body that God's given us, we can indeed glorify Him. You say, preacher, how can we do that? And there's a lot of things I could get into this morning. I'll spare that for the sake of time this morning. But let me, if I may, just say this. It starts out maybe with just raising a hand to the praise and glory of God, to take our bodies and lift up our praise to Him. I remember several years ago at the 11th Avenue Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia, we had a pastor that was visiting from the state of Iowa. He had never been in anything like a Rock of Ages conference. And uh, people were rejoicing and shouting and God was blessing and people were praising the Lord and glorifying Him. 
And I looked down, and he was sitting on the front, and his eyes got that big around. And I looked at him, I thought, boy, uh, there goes a bunch of missionary support, because he supported about 10 Rock of Ages missionaries. I'd preached for him on a number, a number of occasions. And uh, I watched him, and after a while, he started saying, after a little while, he'd say, Amen. And by the next day, he was standing with his hands lifted to heaven and said, Amen! Glory to God! Hallelujah! To praise Him with all that God has given to us. Matthew 5, 16, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do our good works bring glory to Him? Does it cause others to rejoice and give him the glory. I believe our worship ought to be contagious. In 2 Corinthians 4, 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound unto the glory of God. Oh, that we might be like Moses, that we might ask God to see us glory. As Moses did in Exodus chapter number 33 and verse number 18, he said, I beseech thee. In other words, I beg of thee. I plead of thee. I put my request in before God. Show me thy glory. I don't believe there's ever been a greater request recorded in the pages and the annals of time or throughout the entire Bible than the request that Moses laid at the foot of God when he said, God, show me thy glory. God showed him his glory. God put him in the cave and held his hand over him and as he passed by he saw the hinder part of God he saw God in all of his glory. Now this morning for about ten minutes I want to take and share with you the fourth thing. We'll probably just go through these briefly for the sake of time. But in the book of Ephesians chapter number 3 verse 20 and 21 Paul writing to the church at Ephesus said this now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know this passage of scripture is telling us that God's able to do more than our finite minds can imagine. He is literally saying that when we have reached the ends of our limits and our thoughts and our imagination, and our request before God. When we have extended and stretched ourselves beyond compare, and we have gone further than we've ever gone in life, what he is literally saying is when we have reached the end of our request and our finite ability to request something of God, that God has so much more in mind, and so much more in His resources, and so much more in His power, in His presence. When we reach the end, of our request, we're just beginning to tap into the resources of God. He is able to do not just abundantly above what we ask, but the scripture says He is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask. It's literally saying that we can never exhaust the resources of God. Isn't that wonderful? What is glory? For the most part, the word translated glory in the New Testament is doctrine. And the word, it's where we get our English word doxology. It comes from it, and it's an expression of praise to God. And I know that doxology is usually something that is kind of slow and drawn out, and it's not something that uh, we Baptists rejoice in. But I want you to notice again to remind us of the words of the doxology, and I'm not necessarily implying we should sing it every service, but I want you to rem be reminded of the lyrics to the song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Notice that it starts out with acknowledging that our blessings come from God. Every good and every perfect gift, James said, cometh down from the Father above. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Everyone on this earth, everyone in this congregation, everyone that attends this conference this week should be willing to praise God and lift our hearts and worship to Him and give Him the glory that's through His name. All praise Him above all ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He's worthy of our praise. The glory of God in the church refers to the church having the glory, the power, the resources 
that are needed to do the ministry. For a congregation to meet and have no power of God in our midst is a tragedy. Many times there's no redeeming grace, no salvation. Sometimes there's no moving of the Spirit of God. And I'm for order. We need divine order. We need administration and organization. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a stickler on that. And I'm for that. I'm with it 100%. But my friend, beyond our administration and beyond our organization, we need God to breathe upon our services. The greatest expression of the mighty working of God in the church is the power that is found in salvation, not in creation, but in salvation, in regeneration. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 14 through 18, that by decree God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. He spoke them into existence merely by saying, let there be light, and there was light. But when it comes to the redemption of men and men's soul, it took more than just God speaking it. He sent His Son to the planet Earth to die, to take on in His deity God and, uh, God and also the, uh, the human flesh and to die on the cross for our sin. I think about the song that Brother Kurt Lebeau sings, Give Him the Glory. How many churches and ministries today could Inkabod be written over the interest and exodores of the church because the glory of God is departed. Places where God gets no glory, nobody is hardly ever saved, no one's moved, no one's moved by the sermon, nobody's helped, no one's born again. There's at least five things, areas, and I'll probably only have time for one or two of these quickly this morning, where God can get glory of the church. The word glory, as I said, has five basic meanings throughout the scripture, and so let me jump into these very quickly. One, it refers to the beauty or the impressiveness of God. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 22 and 5, And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding manifold of, of, of excuse me, magnificent, of fame and of glory throughout all uh, countries. I will therefore make preparation for it. And so we found that here in this passage of Scripture, David said, I want God's house to be magnificent. I want the place of worship to be better than any other place on the planet Earth. And I appreciate, if I could say this this morning, I appreciate Gant Street Baptist Church. I appreciate Pastor Rao and the uh, the pursuit of quality for the Lord. And I'm not going to get into all of it this morning uh, for the sake of time. But I've been many a places where the maintenance has not been kept up. I've been many a places where it seems like the church house has fallen apart. It's not been too long ago. I was in a little church, and as we pulled up, I began to weep. And Peggy said, what's wrong with you? I said, look at the church. Literally, the steeple had mold and uh, algae that was growing on it. It looked like barnacles that was growing on it. I'm sure it wasn't, been nowhere close to the sea. But it was in terrible array, and it was so bad, uh, Brother McBride, I literally took my camera out, and I'm walking around uh, taking pictures of everything, and I got busted by the pastor. He came out and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking pictures of the church. Well, I was lying. That's what I was doing. I was taking pictures of the church. But what disarray it was in. We walked in and the mold would take your breath. And I'm not going to go into that. But I'm glad that whatever we do for God ought to be done to the best. To God's glory. It ought to be magnificent. Because why? It gives God the glory. And David said, I may not be able to do it, but I'll leave and make preparation for my son Solomon to build a house that will honor God and bring him glory. Secondly, this morning it refers to the dominion, the power, the majesty, or the might of God. In Psalm, 1, or in Psalm 19, verse number 1, the Bible said the heavens declare the glory of God. I'm glad that God has shown forth you and I His glory, His majesty, His power. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His work shall be. John 17, 5, And now, O Father, glorify me, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
Thank God for the dominion, the power, and the glory that belongs to God. You and I do nothing on our own. And if we do anything, if we happen to accomplish anything on our own, you can rest assured it was not to God's glory. Then thirdly, there is the word that refers to the essential nature and character of God himself. It refers to the very glory of God himself. Moses got a glimpse of it at the burning bush. Israel got a glimpse of it in the wilderness. The priest got a glimpse of it in the tabernacle. Isaiah got a glimpse of it in the temple. And John got a glimpse of it in the scriptures where the Bible said, and the word was made flesh and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when you study the scriptures in the Old Testament concerning glory, you'll notice that as you go in through the book of Ezekiel, that the glory of God departs from the Old Testament. You'll find in Ezekiel 10 and verse number 4, that the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. In verse number 18 of the same chapter, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. In chapter 11 and verse number 23, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain. And so you find the glory of God departing from the Old Testament. But then we come through the uh, 400 years of silence between the Testament and you come into the New Testament and go to John's Gospel. And I read it a moment ago. The Word was made flesh and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Do you know what the greatest expression of God's eternal glory was? It was not in the creation. It was not in all of these things that we could fill in the blank with this morning but it was in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem the soul of man and to give Him opportunity for salvation. The Word was made flesh and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One that was the voice crying in the wilderness. Then there's a fourth. And I'll just mention this in passing. It's used and refers to the brightness and the brilliance of Almighty God. The pillar by a fire by night, the cloud by day. Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. The Shekinah cloud of glory that covered the Holy of Holies at the time. The shepherds in the New Testament. The Bible said a light shone round about in the glory of the Lord. Then, if I can say this, fifthly and quickly, it refers to praise, adoration, thanksgiving. Lord, I hope this week, I hope that as we come together, as we come out of all the places that God's allowed us to be with all these uh, months in the last year, since the last time, it's my prayer that this week that we'll give God all and that He'll be that God would every message, every song, every testimony. Father's revival for you. I pray this one of you will take these few short, simple points. Use it for thy glory. In Christ's name, I pray. Let's all stand. We'll sing it without piano. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Give Him the glory. Let God's people say, Amen.